What caused the country's longest-serving First Minister to resign? In a disclosure special now on BBC One Scotland, Mark Daly examines the pressures that led Nicola Sturgeon to stand down. I want you to give a lift the room for our very own yeah! She's one of the most gifted politicians of her generation and the dominant force in Scottish politics for nearly a decade. Well, Nicola Sturgeon, beyond doubt, is one of the most effective politicians of our times. 80% approval ratings, people loved her, arena tours, treated like a pop star. Incredibly hardworking, with an ability to handle both detail and the big picture. She led the SNP to eight election victories and guided Scotland through the pandemic. But last week, in dramatic fashion, she said it was all over. So today I am announcing my intention to step down as First Minister and leader of my party. Nicola Sturgeon leaves office without achieving her dream of independence and unable to deliver on some controversial election promises. In our context where a trans woman is not a woman. No, there is... <laughs> her path to independence looks blocked. I think that in the cold light of day, the de facto referendum strategy was a dog's breakfast. Tonight on Disclosure, the pressures on Scotland's longest serving First Minister and what her resignation means for a divided SNP. Oh, wait a minute, hang on, stop, 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 Rod. Nicola Sturgeon is resigning. Nicola Sturgeon, the First Minister of Scotland, is going to resign. Well, this is totally, totally unexpected. I would imagine to most people this has come utterly out of the blue. She's expected to make the announcement at a news conference in Edinburgh this morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming along. I'm very proud of what has been achieved in the years I've been in Butte House. Nicola Sturgeon's announcement was broadcast live, causing a political earthquake. It brought the country and newsrooms to a standstill. However, since my very first moments in the job, I have believed that part of serving well would be to know almost instinctively when the time is right to make way for someone else. And when that time came, to have the courage to do so, even if to many across the country and in my party, it might feel too soon. In my head and in my heart, I know that time is now. So to the people of Scotland, thank you from the very bottom of my heart. Her decision took everyone by surprise. I think it really shocked everybody, everybody in Scotland, people across the UK, and further afield, it's actually a significant story internationally as well. And it came despite assuring the public within the last month that she was in it for the long haul. Jacinda Ardern said she doesn't have enough in the tank to continue. How much is in the Nicola Sturgeon's There's tank? There's plenty in the tank uh, at the moment. Either she was not quite telling the truth, which I'm not sure is the case, or that she simply hadn't made a final decision. She outlasted four prime ministers during her tenure. How did her exit speech compare? We set out a vision for a low tax, high growth economy. Getting us all through the pandemic, delivering the fastest vaccine rollout in Europe. I think that the tone of those politicians was one of self-justification, that they were right, that uh, they had no regrets. Uh, but Nicholas was different. We must reach across the divide in Scottish politics. And my judgment now is that a new leader will be better able to do this. You could sense that she knew what her limits were as a politician, that she'd taken the independence movement as far as she could take them, and that she decided basically to, to walk away um, after winning eight elections in a row. So it was an unusual speech, and it'll be one I think it's talked about for years to come. I thought it was deeply moving. I thought it's a real honest reflection of her and how she has felt for probably on and off for quite a long time. And I think 
you know, it was honest and it was genuine and it was really as hard as it was to hear, it was really good to see. What Nicola Sturgeon managed to do in her resignation speech, which is not what Liz Truss managed to do or what Boris Johnson managed to do, is she had gone at a time of her own choosing. And that is the profound difference. Nicola Sturgeon emerged in the 1980s as a firebrand teenage activist. We already have a Tory free Scotland. What we need now is a totally free Scotland. Right, let's just uh, take it. It is quite obvious that there can be a thriving Scottish steel industry, and in an independent Scotland, you can make that happen. Since I was 16, I have contributed as an activist, a campaigner, and a leader. She was in the first intake of MSPs to the brand new Scottish Parliament in 1999. A rising star, she ascended to Deputy First Minister in 2007 as the SNP took power for the first time. Succeeding her mentor Alex Salmond in 2014, Nicola Sturgeon hoped she'd be the one to deliver independence. Despite being the most successful Scottish political leader in recent history, eight years later she leaves office having fallen short of that ambition. I, Shona Robinson. Shona Robinson was amongst that SNP cohort of 1999 and counts Nicola Sturgeon as one of her close friends. She has got a lot of empathy where we've all had challenges in our life, but she was always there and if you needed to speak to her, she would be there for you. When the country locked down in the grip of COVID, the First Minister was there every day briefing the nation. Despite the message, her popularity soared. Think about whether it's worth it to you to run the risk of not being with your family on Christmas Day. That is the toughest message imaginable, but that is what we are, are dealing with. Leading this country through the COVID pandemic is by far the toughest thing I've done. It may well be the toughest thing I ever do. I certainly hope so. By her side most days during COVID was Jean Freeman. It was relentless all day, every day, seven days a week. But my primary focus was health. Now, that was a big focus, but she was responsible for all of it. That relationship that she formed with people across Scotland and arguably wider, I've had people elsewhere tell me about tuning in to the Scottish briefings from outside of Scotland to feel more informed and more reassured. That's entirely down to how she decided she was going to lead this. And she did it every single day because she felt it was her duty um, to offer leadership, reassurance, comfort to the public. That was lacking anywhere else in the UK. And for me, that is a perfect example of the real Nicola. Leading her party to election victories became a trademark. With political dominance came an expectation that progressive change would be delivered. Do you think Looking back on her eight years as First Minister, she's achieved enough. I think she should be proud of things like the Scottish Child Payment and the welfare system, setting up a whole new system of Social Security in, what, four, four years? I suppose one of the more personal things for Nicola was the promise and the commitment she gave to young care leavers. Now we've got an SNP and a Scottish government which is extraordinarily redistributive. It's much more left-wing government than it was when she took over. She has taken hundreds of millions of pounds from departmental budgets and given it to poor people, poor families through the child payment. And it's allowed her to be a more socialist first minister than she has given credit for, frankly. But her years in power have not been without their difficulties. In 2015, Nicola Sturgeon said she should be judged on her record on education. But the attainment gap between children from rich and poorer families remains. Scotland has the highest drugs death rate in Europe. The National Health Service is in the grip of the worst crisis in recent times. The contract to build two ferries is catastrophically overspent and mired in claims of rigging. The entry for the successor is enormous. Um, huge problems, 
all within her gift to deal with. But one policy, unlike any other, looms over her tenure and may even come to define it. Though I know it will be tempting to see it as such, this decision is not a reaction to short-term pressures. In recent weeks, there was one pressure that seemed to throw Nicola Sturgeon completely off balance. The question is, are all trans Look, women women? You haven't is, answered that question. Well, that's not the point that we're dealing with that's here. That's the question I'm asking. Trans women are, are women, but in the prison context, there is no automatic right for a trans woman. So there are contexts where a trans woman is not a woman? No, there is... <laughs> These questions centred on Isla Bryson, a convicted rapist who was charged as a man, but by the time of conviction, identified as a woman and was sent initially to a women's prison. First Minister, um, I think you just referred to Isla Bryson using the word her. Does that mean you do, in fact, think Don't she is a woman? Anything into I, I am trying to rationally... To individual, Look, you started I, saying I'm, her. What I'm trying to do is address the issues rather than take it into the kind of, uh, you know, headline generating. I'm trying to rationally deal with the issues that arise here um, and that's what I'll continue to try to do. But why did you say that? I, you, I, I can't remember. I'll it take your word for it. it. Well, like fine. I couldn't believe that at this stage she hadn't, given all her communication skills, been ready with a particular pat answer, even if it was a pat answer. Um, but she was blindsided by it. As her former advisor, I'd like to hear what you thought sitting watching those exchanges. How well, did you it, feel? It, it, it was uncomfortable watching, but it, it, it was a consequence of the nature of the legislation. It took the government to a place it probably didn't really want to be. We'd never seen her stumble in that way. You know, Nicola Sturgeon, master communicator. So for her to be in a place where it almost felt like she couldn't put a sentence together correctly, that was something genuinely new and genuinely different and I think really surprised people. The issues raised by the Bryson case go to the heart of one of Nicola Sturgeon's key political pledges, gender recognition reform. It appeared to symbolise the risk that a man who had sexually abused a woman, who had raped a woman, could decide for their own reasons to now say that they were a woman too. The bill brought before Parliament last year would remove the need for a medical diagnosis and allow trans people to self-identify. It was intended to make the lives of trans people easier and was passed at Holyrood with cross-party support. I've not been able to access a gender recognition certificate because I've been on the waiting list for the NHS gender identity clinics to get that uh, medical diagnosis for, for almost five years now with no, uh, no end in sight in terms of an initial appointment. The new process would remove the need for that diagnosis. It would mean that I would finally be able to get that document. Um, and that means that I'd be able to guarantee dignity in things like marriage. Uh, if I get married, I want to know that I'm going to be with recorded as, as a bride, as the wife. But the reforms have also met with fierce opposition. We built an army of women who refuse to accept politicians voting away our rights. Some women feared the impact self-identification could have on the protection of single-sex spaces. This created an intractable and often toxic debate. We're trans right, they're under attack. What do we do? My party has never voted at conference for a system of self-identification, and it is not what was promised in the manifesto. Joanna Cherry was sacked from a front bench Westminster role, she says, because of her views on gender reform. I'm in favour of looking at the Gender Recognition Act. But the problem with the bill is that, as the First Minister herself has said, it doesn't give any new rights to trans people. It gives a right to anyone to self-identify as the opposite sex after three months of living as a woman, which phrase is undefined, with minimal safeguards. It has caused huge division in the party and we've lost many members as a result of it. The UK government has used its powers to block the bill, which now sits in limbo. 
what's gone wrong with the Gender Recognition Reform Bill is a microcosm of what's gone wrong under Nicola's leadership. We have a, a policy, the detail of which was not properly thought through, which was never debated at our conference, where dissenters were demonised and where we didn't take the public with us. Jean Freeman says she supports gender reform, but has concerns about how this bill was handled. Would you have supported it as it currently sits? Uh, no, I wouldn't have supported it as it currently sits. But I would have been in Parliament making an argument for some of the concerns that were raised that I consider to be legitimate to be um, addressed. We needed to pay more attention to the concerns being raised, particularly by women, about their space. Has it been an issue that has divided public opinion? Yes, yes it has. Other countries, though, have managed to go down the road of reforming gender recognition uh, without any of the, the challenges that, and, and fears coming to fruition that, that people have expressed. Probably for the first time in recent years, Nicola Sturgeon was paddling against the wave of the majority of public opinion. Now, that's not to make a judgment on whether or not the gender reforms were the right thing or the wrong thing. But polling was pretty clear. She was not in tune with where the majority of the Scottish public was. In the wake of the Isla Bryson row, Nicola Sturgeon saw her personal approval rating slight. It's all left an atmosphere of bitterness and division lingering over the party as she departs. I know there will be some across the country who feel upset by this decision and by the fact I am taking it now. Of course, for balance, there will be others who will, uh, how should I put this, cope with the news just fine. Nicola Sturgeon has enjoyed popularity on levels other party leaders could only dream of. She packed out arenas. She went on US talk shows, but her final years in office will be remembered for the most bitter of fallouts. I have not sexually harassed anyone, and I certainly have not been engaged in criminality. When complaints of sexual assault were made against her former mentor, Alex Salmond, which he denied, their relationship disintegrated. I swear by Almighty God that I'll tell the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. It was all so painfully public, played out in the parliament they dominated for nearly 15 years. I know just from what he told me that his behaviour was not always appropriate. And yet across six hours of testimony, there was not a single word of regret. I've got no doubt that Nicola has broken the ministerial code, but it's not for me to suggest the what the consequences should be. For his part, Alex Salmond accused his former protégé of being in the orbit of a plot to smear him, destroy his political career and send him to jail. Pressurising witnesses, a collusion with witnesses. We're talking about the construction of evidence. I had no motive, intention, desire to get Alex Hammond. It was extraordinary political theatre. It was also an acrimonious end to the most successful partnership in the history of the Scottish Parliament. It was difficult, it was sad. I think it became an issue of who was going to basically win the argument. Alex Hammond's argument didn't prevail and Nicola Sturgeon did. At his criminal trial, Mr Salmond was acquitted of every charge. Nicola Sturgeon was cleared by an investigation into her conduct, but the whole affair was hugely bruising. So given how close she was to Alex Salmond, given how much she admired and respected him, for their relationship to turn so toxic, I think was a major moment in her life. And I wouldn't underestimate um, how much it contributed to her feeling scunnered. The wounds show no sign of healing. An independence vote over Here eight is months. Alex Salmond accusing her focus on gender reform of damaging the cause of independence. Of gradually building, 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 building till we get independence over 50% and then throw it away in some self-indulgent nonsense. If you look at some of the divisions that I think that contributed to her decline, gender recognition reform, 
the uh, split on independence strike. These are almost proxy battles for the divisions between Alex Salmond and Nicola Sturgeon. If the past is difficult to look back on for Nicola Sturgeon and her party, there could be more trouble ahead. Have you been or do you expect to be interviewed by the police who are looking into your not, party's I'm finances? Not gonna, I'm not going to discuss uh, an ongoing police investigation. I wouldn't do that on any issue and I'm not going to do it now. The investigation she won't comment on is over questions around how £600,000 of party funds was spent. The allegation is that fraud has taken place, that money that was specifically raised for one purpose in DF2 was spent on another. There's no doubt that this is a black cloud hovering over the SNP. In 2021, Joanna Cherry resigned from the SNP's ruling executive committee, citing concerns over transparency. She was one of five such resignations in the space of two months. There were members who resigned around about the same time from the Finance and Audit Committee and the Treasurer over similar uh, concerns. And you spoke to them at the time about why they were resigning? Yes. And that was to do with not getting eyes on the accounts? Yes. And what is your worry about the SNP party finances? Well, I'm not going to comment on a live police investigation, but I have concerns about the whereabouts of that money. Then there's also questions over an unreported loan of more than £100,000 to the SNP from Peter Murrell, Nicola Sturgeon's husband and chief executive of the party. When did you first know your husband had loaned the SNP £107,000? Can't recall exactly when I first knew that, but what he does with his uh, resources is a matter for him. This is a curious affair. For Nicola Sturgeon to say that uh, she can't recall when she first learnt about this seems a bit odd. Maybe it's nothing. Maybe there's a very simple explanation for it. But if there is, I think she should be providing. I do think it's time for Peter Murrell to step down and for us to have a new chief executive. Like many others, I never thought it was healthy to have a husband and wife team running the government and the party. And there is a bit of a smell around the finances. Police Scotland say it's working closely with the Crown Office while investigations continue. The SNP says it's cooperating fully with the investigation. When Nicola Sturgeon took over, there were high hopes within her party she'd lead them to independence. Eight years later, the dial has barely shifted. It's carrying on right for me. And more importantly, is me carrying on right for the country, for my party, and for the independence cause I have devoted my life to. During her time in office, the UK government has categorically refused to sanction a second referendum. And last year, the Supreme Court issued the hammer blow to independence supporters when it said the SNP couldn't legally hold one without Westminster's permission. When she was faced with that brick wall of the Supreme Court saying no, what she should have done was pause and say, well, what are our options now? What she did was rush at that wall and try and clamber over it. The next national election scheduled for Scotland is, of course, the UK general election, making that both the first and the most obvious opportunity to seek what I described back in June as a de facto referendum. Nicola Sturgeon's plan was to make the next general election effectively a vote on independence. If the SNP won, she said they would have a mandate to take Scotland out of the UK. Yeah, I mean, that came from nowhere. I mean, I know that quite close advisers to her were scrambling around the next day trying to understand what this even meant. Some of Nicola Sturgeon's advisers were blindsided by the de facto referendum announcement. Yeah. In the cold light of day, the de facto referendum strategy was a dog's breakfast. Uh, this idea of turning the next general election into a de facto referendum, um, that triggered a big backlash internally in her own party. This was a policy that was improvised. You know, a referendum is a referendum. A parliamentary election for Westminster is what it is. It does what it says on the tin. You cannot pretend that it's something else. Her referendum strategy has split the party and now looks likely to be scrapped. Did Nicola Sturgeon realise that she had just run out of roads 
on her independent strategy. She failed to increase support, and because of that, she just had to go. I don't think that the failure uh, is is ours or Nicola's failure about the, the strategy. The failure is the UK government's lack of democracy in trying to deny the Scottish people their right to choose. I mean, that's an incredible state of affairs. If the independence movement is a, a bit stuck at the moment, it's stuck because the other side of this equation keeps saying no. She has led them up a cul-de-sac when it comes to independence. Her strategy hasn't worked. And whoever takes over, they're going to have to inherit that mess. Finding the way forward will be for whoever comes next. But this isn't like the last time around. There is no natural successor. And the party is divided on key issues and strategy. The SNP in recent years has been a succession of bin fires. And it's about to be a bin fire again in a leadership contest. Because the, this won't be pretty. And just how do you follow the Sturgeon era? Hopefuls from her party are now lining themselves up to succeed her. Basically, whoever they get is not going to be as good as the person who's leaving. Will they be able to take the cause of independence any further forward than Nicola Sturgeon? There are unionists gloating that Nicola Sturgeon's gone. They're thinking, game over, done. Independence is dead, nationalism is dead. That's been said before. And it was, wasn't true then, and it's not true now. Are you worried about the future of your party? No, I'm not. We've lost a leader who was very widely respected. And we don't yet know who the new leader is going to be. But I think what will be very important for the party going forward is not to place all its expectations on one man or one woman. It's right that we now have the opportunity in the SNP, but more widely across the country, to have a wider discussion about where we're going as a country and for the SNP to have a wider discussion about what more do we need to do to chart the route towards a referendum for people to decide if they want independence or not. It will now be for someone else to chart that route. To all of the people of Scotland, whether you voted for me or not, please know that being your First Minister has been the privilege of my life. Nicola Sturgeon walks away as Scotland's longest serving First Minister, a politician of great skill and a divisive figure. Nicola Sturgeon probably dreamt that she would be the politician that would take Scotland to independence. I think she gradually woke up to the fact that that was not the case. The progress that she could have made, she didn't make. She is no doubt an incredibly impressive politician, but we are all struggling, all commentators, all journalists that I've spoken to today, to say what has she achieved? Well, there is debate over the political legacy Nicola Sturgeon leaves behind. There's little doubt about her impact as the first woman to hold Scotland's highest office. There's that saying about you can't be what you can't see. She was a great model that women could achieve on their own terms while being themselves, while being working class, while being authentic. So we've got something a bit special. We've got a woman leader of significant standing who has decided the right thing for her and for her country is to step aside now. That takes, that takes courage. Thank you from the very bottom of my heart.